We are in a series right now just simply called Jesus Said Blessed. It is taken from the book of Matthew chapter 5 where it begins the Sermon on the Mount. To be blessed is to have the favor of God on your life. It means to be doing well. And you know, it really helps us understand it if you know the opposite. It is the opposite of cursed. Everybody wants to be the opposite of cursed, right? Yeah, we understand that. We want to be blessed. We want to favor the blessing of God on our life. Jesus said, Matthew 5, 3 through 5, He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those that know that they desperately need the Lord. They're blessed because the kingdom of heaven is for them. He reigns and rules in our lives. Jesus said, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who mourn. Yes, when we go through sorrow, we mourn, and we are comforted by our Heavenly Father. The only time I can I have found in Scripture where the Bible tells us to mourn is in regard to our sin or the sins of others. And when we mourn our sin, we are comforted because we find repentance and forgiveness and cleansing. Jesus said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. First, we need to know what it means to be meek and, well, what it's not. For most people, a meek person is maybe somebody who's quiet, shy, and easily intimidated. And in our rough and tough world, we tend to think, I think most people do anyway, they think of meekness as being a weakness, being soft, and maybe somebody who is powerless to defend themselves. But it doesn't mean a wimp or coward or somebody that's weak or easily intimidated. No, the word that's translated meek here is found in several other places in the New Testament and in most of the other modern translations, they they change it from the word meek to gentle or gentleness. And the reason being is that we don't hardly use the word meek in our culture. Especially if you're not talking about the Bible, it's just a word that is not very common and, and not very easily understood because we don't really use it, at least not in a biblical way. But gentle is the closest commonly used word that we have. So let me just put it this way. Meekness means gentleness or mildness of disposition. And it carries with it this implication of humility because meekness and humility almost always go hand in hand. Meek doesn't mean pushover. But it is never pushy. And we need to know that. A meek person is someone who is gentle even if they have great strength. A meek person is one who sees himself as God sees him and he's comfortable with being kind, being mild-mannered with others. So don't confuse meekness with weakness because, you know, sometimes weak people can be fearful and it causes them to act out in an aggressive way. And that's not meekness at all. So we need to realize that meekness has nothing to do with weakness. In the original Greek text, the word that is translated as meek it could be used of an animal that has been well trained. And in other words, if, if you had a powerful horse and it was trained and, and uh, to the point that a small child could ride it, they would have used this word to say it was gentle or that it was meek. And we need to understand that, you see, no matter how strong we might be in some area of our life, we still need to be gentle. We need to be meek. But it certainly doesn't mean weakness. Jesus was the most powerful man that ever lived. And He was meek, gentle, lowly, and humble. You know, our world admires people of great physical strength. 
We see these guys, you know, they get big, huge muscles and they can lift so much weight and do all of this stuff. And people go, wow, wow. I want you to know they're not even in Jesus' league. This guy could command the wind and the waves. There's not anything that he couldn't do. And yet, he was meek and lowly. So different from the attitude of the world around us. And you see, these kingdom principles, they just fly in the face of the attitudes of the world. They are so counterculture. They're so different from the way that we normally think. And it's kind of hard for us to really wrap our mind around it and really get a hold of this. That's why we need the help of the Holy Spirit this morning, that we really understand this spiritual truth. And it is spiritual truth. Our Savior never spoke anything but truth. It wasn't just true for a little while or true in His day. No, He speaks eternal truth. And He says, blessed are the meek. They shall inherit the earth. You see, Jesus, He was never weak. He had all the power and authority, but He never used it for selfish gain or for selfish motives. He was always submitted to His Father. When was the last time you heard someone say, if you want to succeed in life, if you want to get ahead, if you want to rise to the top, you got to be meek and gentle. No, that's not the way of the world at all. They say just the opposite. You got to push, you got to make your way, you got to be ambitious, you need to be forceful, you got to get it done. Assert yourself. An atheist philosopher said, assert yourself, care nothing except for yourself. The only vice is weakness. The only virtue is strength. Be strong. Be a superman. The world is yours if you can get it. Now that might sound just a little extreme, but it's not really that far off from the attitude of the culture that we live in. Meekness is just not considered to be a valuable quality in our day. But the principles of the kingdom are true, even when they are opposite from the culture around us. Jesus said, blessed are the meek. We need to get this. We really are blessed. We got the favor of God on our life. We're going to do well when we are meek, when we are gentle, when we are mild. Yes, we're going to be blessed the meek will inherit the earth. He's not saying that we are going to take over the world in this life. Listen, that kind of teaching and doctrine is not from the Scriptures. We are going to inherit the earth in the end of the age. We need to understand that and know that. And it's not going to be the forceful, the arrogant, the pushy. No, it's going to be the meek. There's a lot of great examples in the Scripture of meekness, but one of those, one of the best examples is Moses. Numbers 12 and 3 says in the King James that Moses was the meekest man in the whole world. Now, in other translations, it says that he was the most humble man. And I'm just making the point again here that these two go hand in hand. But at 40 years of age, I don't think that Moses had a meek bone in his body. (laughs) Moses was a powerful figure in Egypt. He was raised in Pharaoh's household. He had wealth, education, fame, notoriety, and power. In fact, Acts 7.22 tells us Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. Now, I want you to remember this, that Moses was mighty in words. I mean, this guy could talk powerful, powerful. I don't know if this is a vocabulary, the way he did it, but the Bible makes mention of this. He was mighty in words and deeds and his actions. This was a powerful man. At 40, he used his strength to kill a man. 
From birth, he had been called by God to deliver his people from the bondage, the slavery of Egypt. So when he sees one of these Egyptians abusing one of his brethren, he kills the man. He used his strength to kill a man. Well, that's not meekness at all. And I want to tell you something. That is not a man that God will use. God does not need the strength of man. And He will not use a man that is not under the control of the Holy Spirit. No, we can't just do things in our flesh and with our own strength. Moses, when he found out that he that it was known what he had done, he fled and he goes out into the wilderness for 40 years. He tended sheep 40 years. That's a long lesson. But Moses learned to be meek. Something changed in him somehow because then when God calls him from a burning bush and tells him it's time for him to go back to Egypt to deliver his people from slavery, what does Moses say? He says, who am I? He says, I can't go. He says, I can't even speak. He was mighty in word and deed. But now, at 80 years old, he says, I can't go. I'm nobody. I, I can't even speak. Amazing. But the Lord can use a man like that who's not looking to his own strengths. Moses came back a different man. And when he goes back to Egypt, the Lord didn't send him empty-handed, but the Lord gave him mighty power. Moses would use his staff and miracles would happen. But understand this, Moses never used that power for anything but what the Lord wanted him to do. And Moses became one of the greatest leaders in the Scripture. And the Scripture des describes him as the meekest man in all the earth. He's the man that God used to bring His people out of Egypt, to lead them through the wilderness to the promised land. He used this man Moses to lead them through a, a, a million to two million people, to lead them through a place where water and food were scarce. Amazing. But even more than that, Moses was a great spiritual leader. He was the one who would speak to God face to face as a man with his friend. Who was this man? He was the meekest man in all the earth. Imagine it. So different from the leaders of our day and those who were exalted and lifted up, even in church culture. How we have this so backward. And we, as the people of God, we should know better. No. We want to be like our Lord Jesus, not like the world. Moses did have one more time that he lost control when the Lord told him to speak to the rock and water would come out. In his frustration with the people, he strikes the rock with his staff and the water flowed out. But the Lord was not pleased with what he had done. And he told Moses that because he did this, he would not enter into the promised land himself. Now I want you to know something. 
that Moses is still a great man of God and a great leader. There are only two that appeared to Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, Moses and Elijah. So yes, he's still honored by God and still a great man. But we need to know this, that sometimes when we use our strength not under the control of the Holy Spirit, it's going to cost us. Another example is the great King David. I don't know that David is always a good example of meekness or gentleness in the Scripture, but he certainly had his moments. But just think about this. David, this mighty warrior who killed a lion and a bear. He killed Goliath, that nine-foot-tall giant. They sang about David that he has killed his tens of thousands. Men would follow, line up. They would line up to follow David into battle even before he was king. He was such a great, mighty warrior. How could this man possibly have been meek? Because David knew, I mean, of all people, David knew that the battle doesn't belong to the mighty. This is right. The battle does not belong to the mighty, but to the Lord. And when we understand that, it changes our attitude about things. David knew that very well when he faced off with Goliath. He said, I come against you in the name of the Lord. He knew that it was the Lord that would give him the victory. It wasn't his strength and his power. And oh, if we could just learn this, it is not dependent upon our strengths, our talents, our abilities, how great we are. It is how great our God is. And when we understand that, yes, we can be be gentle and meek and humble. Yes. You see, amazing story about David after he was king and At one point, his son Absalom uh, is trying to take over the throne. And I kind of think that David uh, could have rallied the troops and defeated those that opposed him, but instead he left. And as he's leaving, there's this man named Shimei walking along, cursing him and throwing stones at him. Now, uh, just think about this. This is David who's killed his tens of thousands, David, who killed Goliath, the giant. And here's this worm of a man cursing at David and throwing rocks at him. David could have dropped him with a sling and a stone. One of David's mighty men says, let me go take his head off. Sound like a good idea to me. Well, here's what David says. 2 Samuel 16, 11 through 13, he says, Let him alone and let him curse, for so the Lord has ordered him. I don't know about that, but I, that's another, another message another time. It may be that the Lord will look on my affliction and the Lord will repay me with good for his cursing this day. Bless those who curse you. And as David and his men went along the road, Shimei went along the hillside opposite him and cursed him as he went, threw stones at him and kicked up dust. David understood that the sovereign Lord is in control. He says, maybe the Lord's going to bless me because of this wrong. He had all the power. He could have easily killed the man or had him killed. But he didn't use it. It was under control. And he trusted the sovereign Lord to take care of him. I want you to know that we have the best example in the New Testament, in the Lord Jesus, our Savior, the one who says, follow me, right? We're supposed to be learning to be like him. Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Jesus says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 
And I'll tell you, when we're going through a difficult time and we feel the weight, the burdens of life, and it's pressing down on us, how wonderful that verse is. But we need to read a couple more verses here to really understand how this works. He says, Come to me, all you labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. you got to learn from Jesus. You want rest? You're going to have to learn from Jesus. He says, learn from me, for I am gentle. The King James says, meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. See, soul and mind, will, and emotion. How do you find rest for your soul? You learn from Jesus to be meek and lowly. This is our example I want you to think about this this morning. Jesus describes himself this way. He says, for I am meek and lowly. As far as I can tell in the scripture, this is the only virtues that Jesus uses to describe himself. I mean, there's many places where he tells us about himself. He certainly told us why he came. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. He told us what he was going to do. And there are lots of things that he talks about himself, about being the son of God, the bread of life. But these are the two traits that he uses to describe himself. Meek or gentle, lowly, humble. And Jesus was known for these traits. The Apostle Paul mentions it in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 1. He refers to the meekness and gentleness of Christ. Yes, our Savior was meek and gentle. Shouldn't we be meek and gentle? Shouldn't we want to learn from Him to be meek and lowly in heart and we find rest for our souls? There's a prophecy in the book of Matthew that's actually quoted. It's from Isaiah, but Matthew quotes it, and it's in Matthew chapter 12, 18 through 20. It says, Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he will declare justice to the Gentiles. Oh, Jesus brings justice. He will not quarrel nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break. A smoking flax he will not quench. This is the meekness and gentleness of Jesus. He was never rash or brazen. No, Jesus didn't quarrel with anyone. Isn't that amazing? He didn't quarrel with anyone. He didn't lift up his voice in the streets, it says. He wasn't out there rallying the troops. Hey, y'all, come on, come on. No, he didn't lift up his voice in the streets. He wasn't that kind of a leader. A bruised reed he will not break. A smoking flax he will not quench. You see, he was so gentle that the bruised, those who had little life left in them, they were comfortable, they were safe being around Jesus. Jesus was not like other leaders that oppressed people and put people down, had no regard for the weak. Jesus was different. He didn't break a bruised reed snuff out a smoldering wick. I know that Jesus was not always passive. There were times when He was bold as a lion, like when He cleansed the temple. He was forceful. But here is the key thing that we need to understand, we need to know, is that even when He did so, He was under control. He was not out of control. This was no Uh, outburst of anger. He didn't lose his temper. He didn't go into the temple and go berserk. In fact, if you read the Scripture, you, you understand that that's not the picture at all. In John 2, 14 through 17, it says, And he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. 
So he goes in and he sees these people doing all this stuff. And when he made a whip of cords, I don't know how long it took him, but I know this, he stopped it long enough to make a whip of cords. He drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the money, the changers' money, and overturned their tables. And he said to those who sold doves, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. See, Jesus saw what was going on. And first he makes a whip. And then he drives them out. And I want you to just consider this. You see, some people think of Jesus as not being, you know, a strong uh, or forceful man, but he certainly could be. This was their livelihood. And this one man, Jesus, put them all out. Not because he lost his temper. Not because he had this outburst of rage and anger but because he was doing exactly what the Father wanted him to do. This is his Father's house, and he always did what pleased the Father. Amen. And by the way, I'm just this side note. It's not in the notes, but side note. I'll tell you, we need to remember what this Father's house is about. Right. Listen, it is about meeting with God. It is about coming to worship God. It is not so much, it, so much of what's going on in the world in church culture today. They've just kind of lost, lost where this is supposed to be. Oh. House of prayer. Amen. But you know, many times the Lord does want us to be people of action. I mean, you know, in, in this situation here, the people would come to the temple to, to worship God and instead of being ministered to, they were being fleeced. And, you know, I want you to understand that, yes, there are times when there are injustices that we need to be people of action. But you see, it needs to always be in, in obedience to the Lord, not just because we were angry. When the soldiers came to the garden to take Jesus away, Peter steps up with a sword and takes a swing at a guy and cuts off his ear. And I always like to point out, I don't think that this fisherman was such a good swordsman that he is like, I'm going to get your ear. No, I think he was trying to take the guy's head off. And he managed to get an ear. And I want you to see what Jesus says to Peter. Matthew 26, 52 and 53 says, Put your sword in its place. All who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you, do you think that I cannot pray to my Father? Now pray to my Father, and He will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels. See, Jesus had all the authority. He had all the power. It was through the Word of God. Jesus is the Word of God. It was through the Word of God that the worlds were framed. He had all the power. He said, don't you know, I can, right now, I can call and my Father will give me 12 legions of angels. Listen, you see, it's not about having the power. It's about that power being under the control of the Holy Spirit. Jesus didn't use His authority and power that way, but he subjected himself to the will of the Father. They struck him with their fists, they whipped him, they whipped him, they made fun of him, they mocked him with a crown of thorns, and they crucified him. And he had the power to stop it, but he didn't use it. It was power that was under control. I want to remind you again from Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. He says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. He was meek. Shouldn't we be? Shouldn't we? He says, Learn from me. Shouldn't we be learning from Him? You see, I want you to understand that sometimes we think of things like being meek as just a personality trait that, you know, some have it and some don't, but... No, this is something that you can learn. And I see that Moses learned it. It took him 40 years, but he became the meekest man in the whole world. I'm learning. I struggle with this. But I, I'm learning, though. 
Maybe by the time I'm 80, I'm just... But you see, we can choose. We can choose to be meek. We can choose to humble ourselves and to trust the Lord. Even in those areas where maybe we are strong, you see, and we have a tendency to want assert to assert our strength and use our strength. It is especially in those areas that we need to submit ourselves to the Holy Spirit and allow Him to have His way and to do what He wants in and through our lives. It's not just physical strength. No, it's other strengths that we might have in our life also. See, you might be the boss... But you need to be meek and gentle. You might have the most money. But that doesn't mean you force your way. See, you might be the one with the higher IQ, or maybe you've got the most education, or maybe you've got the most talent, the most ability. But that doesn't mean that you should use your strength to overpower others to get your way. There's all kinds of strengths that we could have that we could use against others, but we have to choose to be gentle and mild instead. You see, there's something about strength that's under control that is beautiful. And there's, well, something repulsive about a person who has power and strength and uses it to take advantage of others or to hurt others. I mean, we all understand this, you know, a strong, powerful man who uses his physical ability to abuse his wife and children. It's repulsive. And we don't consider that man to be a strong man. We consider that man to be a coward and a weakling to do such a thing. But you see, we understand it in that gross example, but we also need to understand it about our own personal lives where we have strengths and maybe sometimes we are not gentle, but instead we are forceful and harsh and pushy. How much better to be like our Savior? You know, in the culture we live in, there's so many who use power to intimidate, to push others around, to demand, to demand their way and to take advantage. And it's amazing is that so often people think of those as leaders. We in the church, in the kingdom of God, we should know better. Jesus is the greatest leader that ever lived. And it's not by force. And it's not because he's the most powerful. It's not because he used his power and ability to make people serve him. No. Jesus is meek and gentle, humble and lowly. See, meek is the person who could demand their way, but puts others before himself. Meek is having the power but not using it. Meek is being smarter, but not having to act like it. It is being right, but you don't have to prove it. I struggle with some of these things. Anybody else? I mean, when, especially when I hear people, you know, spouting doctrine and things from the Scripture, and they got it all twisted up and it ain't right. I just want to straighten them out real quick and prove to them you're wrong. Come on. But that's not always the right thing to do. And it, it, even if it is, it isn't the right attitude to do it. No, we're supposed to be gentle and instruct with gentleness and a spirit of meekness. I have a really good example in my wife. You know, she's a music major. She can sing. She can play a couple of instruments. She's directed all ages of choirs, children's choirs, youth choirs, adult choirs. She served as choir director for three different churches. She's done musicals with adults, musicals with teenagers, musicals with children. In fact, she worked in a public school as a music teacher for seven years. And during that time, she did 27 musicals. She has a little bit of 
experience and knowledge and know-how. But if you work with her in the music area, she will never tout her knowledge or let you know that she knows ten times as much as you. No, she's meek and gentle and mild. She won't ever intimidate you or make you feel dumb. I remember one time we were starting a new youth worship team and we had some young guys that had never really played instruments before and they were learning to play the guitar. And so we, we gave them the music, we gave them the chords to learn the songs. And one of these young men, he's never played before, he comes to us and we're standing there talking to this, you know, 14 year old as he tells us, informs us that these are not the right chords. And we said, yes, they are. And he's like, no, they're not. They're different for a guitar. We're like, yes, these are the right ones. And, you know, Carmen is kind and gentle and, you know, it convinces him, and, you know, just by telling him, yes, these really are the right ones. You know, she doesn't demean him or make him feel dumb. I might a little bit, <laughs> but <laughs> Carmen's not going to do that. And I've just, I've just given you an illustration. You see, all of us have areas maybe where we're strong or maybe we, you know, have an advantage over others, but we don't have to use that in our pride, our arrogance, and push to get our way. But instead, we ought to try to be like the Lord Jesus. Amen. I want to tell you, I'm, I'm learning. I'm learning. But here's the blessing that Jesus spoke. The meek inherit the earth. You, you know, if you inherit a business or an estate, that means that it's turned over to you. I want you to know that Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, He is the example of being meek and lowly, and He is coming to rule and to reign this earth. But you need to know this, blessed are the meek, they will inherit the earth. We, the meek now, the meek will rule and reign with Jesus. Hear this. It will not be the arrogant. It will not be the forceful. It will not be the crafty. No. They will not reign in that kingdom. The meek will reign in that kingdom. The meek will inherit the earth. how we need to be gentle with people. I'll remind you that the only time Jesus was forceful was when He was dealing with the religious people or the self-righteous. With everybody else, He was gentle and meek. There's another blessing that I see here for the meek, that they are freed from the bondage of pride, from the fear of man, from having to win. You see, when we walk in the Spirit, we are meek. The Bible tells us in Galatians 5, and 23, nine things that make up the fruit of the Spirit. And there you find this one in the King James. It says, meek. In the other translations, it says, gentleness. This is something that the Holy Spirit can produce in us if we will but yield to Him and allow Him to lead and guide us instead of us just acting upon our own natural inclinations. Right. See, I grew up watching those John Wayne movies. And oh, how I loved it. Still like them. I mean, all these other movies nowadays. What? Anyway, I'm old. That's right, I'm old. Anyway, but here's, here's one of the wrong things that I learned from John Wayne. There's a problem. Problem with some people. How are you going to fix it? By force. Natural inclination. Wrong, wrong, wrong. You know what Jesus' way is? Gentle, meek, humble. This is, you see, it might not be our natural inclination, but when we are under the control of the Holy Spirit, then meekness, gentleness, is part of what the Holy Spirit produces in us. And in those times when we are tempted to be forceful and pushy and brazen, it is in those times especially that we need to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to help us to be meek and gentle and to do the right thing, what would please our Father. I, I have no problem 
being meek or gentle around children or weak people. I, but I struggle sometimes in being meek and gentle with pushy, mean people. It's hard for me. I mean, you know, I, I want to, I get that, like Moses wasn't too far off at 40. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it just makes me really angry. But here's the thing. We got to allow the Holy Spirit to help us to overcome those inclinations. And when I'm dealing with a, a, a mean and, and, you know, pushy person, that's the time that I have to especially say, Lord, help me to do the right thing and be the way that you want me to be. So no matter what the situation, though, we should be meek and stay under the control of the Holy Spirit and do what's right and pleasing to the Lord. I want to go to Psalm 37. We're not going to be here long, but we're going to read verses 7 through 11. This passage of Scripture just really hits home. It's so needed in our generation, and I, I use it often, but I really think it speaks to the message today. Beginning from verse 7, it says, Rest in the Lord. Rest in the Lord. Y'all remember reading about that when we're meek and lowly, we find rest. Well, here he says, Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. You see, part of being meek and gentle is being able to trust God, being able to turn it over to God, that we don't have to take the bull by the horns and do it our way, but we can trust God. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Cease from anger. See, we can't allow ourselves to get caught up in the anger of our society Cease from anger. Forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only causes harm. A lot of people angry. They're all upset and bent out of shape. It only causes harm. And the Bible tells us, cease from anger. Forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only causes harm. Evil doers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord shall inherit the earth. Those that wait on the Lord will inherit the earth. I thought it was the meek. Oh, there's a strong connection here. You see, we need to understand that when we're meek, we don't have to force things. We can wait on God. We can trust God. Our God is a sovereign God, and He has all the power. And the battle belongs to Him. Well, if we would just wait on the Lord. Sometimes the Lord has us take action, but that action has to be under His control. Verse 10, He says, For yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for His place, but it shall be no more. But the meek shall inherit the earth. There it is. Those that wait on the Lord, the meek, they're the same people. We can trust the Lord. And the last part, and they shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. See, this is the strangest thing, but when we are truly meek and we're waiting on the Lord, we don't have to worry, we don't have to fear, we don't have to stress, we have the abundance of peace. Because we're waiting on our God. We're trusting our God. An abundance of peace. Does that sound good to anybody but me? An abundance of peace. Wait on the Lord. The meek are going to inherit the earth. See, who's going to win in the end? The meek. They're going to inherit the earth. How would you treat others if you knew that in the end you win? How would you handle a difficult situation if you knew that in the end you're going to win? Jesus, meek and lowly, mild, gentle, humble. Matthew 21 and 5 tells us about his triumphal entry. Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you lowly. King James says, Me. Sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. He's the king of kings, the Lord of lords. He's going to reign and rule forever. 
And the meek, well, they're going to reign with him. Blessed are the meek, the gentle. I want you to stand with me. We're going to pray. I'd like for our prayer partners to come.